We're interviewing Mr. Eugene Fuller. Uh, it is uh, April 11th, 2001 at the Kingston, New York Armory. Michael Akey is the interviewer. Eric Stott is the videographer. Uh, Mr. Fuller, where were you born? Ellenville, New York in 1927, July 12th, 1927. And you grew up in Ellenville? No, no, that, I li live in Eureka. Eureka, New York is underwater now under the Roundout Reservoir, the Merriman Dam. They took us out and I was there until about 12 years old. Went out in 1939 we got out of there. They bought our farm, well they bought the place, we had a grist mill over 100 years old with three turbine wheels in it. But the flood of 28, I was one year old, the flood of 28 took it out. Took the dams out on the round out and all that. My father run it. He had to quit school when he was six years old because his dad died and he had to run it for his mother. And he was in the sixth grade, rather, not six years old. And, and then Fuller, or Orson Fuller, run it before that. But, and that's the way it went. And the city took it and they give you so long to get out. And if you didn't get out, you had to pay them rent for your place. That's the way they did. I'm an eminent domain. They come up, you're going to be out by a certain time, or you're going to start paying rent on it. Now you can buy it back if you want for something. I don't think, I think we got, I don't know what the heck we got, a little over $20,000 for the thing. We had a stream, round out stream, some of the chestnut. Today they couldn't even buy 100 feet of the damn round out stream like we had for what they paid for the whole place. So that would, we had about 40 acres. And where did you go after you left? Well, we looked all over Saugerties and all over us and the doctor used to be in town, Dr. Kimball. And uh, he, he tried to buy, uh, he tried to buy down part way down, coming down here to Kingston, there's a big house on the left he wanted. He was mad because they wouldn't sell it to him. Dad, he tried to buy up towards, going up towards what we call sundown. Uh, a place, but the guy didn't want to sell it. it. Was still on the round out. He always lived on the round out stream, and uh, they wouldn't sell it. So he ended up buying up in Grainsville, four and a half acres, more or less, from Mr. Coombs. Uh, Mr. Coombs is a politics and that, but he was a banker in those days. That was their summer home we bought. It was up on piers. I know I was 12 years old, and I used to fish and all that, and yeah. I used to go with a gun up and down the stream hunting water snakes, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, I said, Dad, why did we buy this place? I can't even dig a fish worm here. There's red shale and stuff. I, I could dig a pocket full of fish worm where I was. I said, why, why did we buy this? There's nothing here. There's no stream. The swamp out and back. Why? Uh, well, I don't know. Somebody's... He didn't know where the hell to go. We tried, he found out you're not going to get what he had. It was impossible. Way back then in 39, you could not buy it. You know, he went up in Peekamoo, way up, we, he didn't want to go. There was a small stream, he didn't want to go with that. So we bought it, made the best. The day we got it, he built another house. And Mr. Healy had made the dam. He wanted to buy it. Anthony come in with all the ukes. That man worked with Healy. I worked with Healy on the reservoir in the late 40s. Anthony come back. And uh, he wanted to buy it for his, when he stayed here, he brought all the ukes in and bid the round out reservoir, the Never Sink Reservoir, down up above Downsville and all of them, made tunnels. And later on I worked for Fraser Davis making a tunnel for five years. Now, where'd you go to a school? Well, I went there in Grainsville, we had a grade school and they finally made it into a high school later on. In the, in the 40s and 50s, but I uh, we went to Grainsville to the eighth grade, then we had to go with bus to Elmville, the high school. I went through high school and when I, I went to my third year and finished that up, and the war was going on, that was 45, and I said, gee whiz, I want to get in this, all these other guys are going, so I said, that's it, I want to join up, I, I turned 18, I joined up 17 and went up in Albany and uh, at the post office there. I think it was the post office in those days, right along the railroad track. Anyway, each floor was a different service. And I took Don Turbush with me. He's another one. He finally got him to send his papers in, anyhow. And uh, we both went in. We won. 
I said, Let, I'd rather ride and walk. Let's join up the Navy. The hell with this Marine Corps and the Army walking. So we, <laughs> we went in on one floor and joined up, and they could have signed me up for 20 years. I would have known the difference. I wanted to go in. Anyway, they put us in a USNR V6, which didn't mean a damn thing to me. We was in the service. That's all we wanted to do. We come back. They call us up. Had to go by bus up to Albany. Uh, and stayed in the water of elite arsenal that night, and then we put us on a train to Sampson, New York. We got up there, we one number apart, went in the same company. I don't even have the picture. I don't know, my kids, when my wife passed away after 36 years with cancer, where I, the kids got pictures in this, and I had a book of what, of some of the pictures overseas and stuff. The kids got a whole, always looking at that and talking. They got a big barn loaded with stuff, and I can't find it. And the, the other one, even my, my picture of the company, or the... What was Samson like? We were in G unit, Gestapo unit, they call it. Well, Samson was good. It was, you couldn't beat it. It was a good, it was the toughest, both have been the toughest u unit they had, the G unit. And we had German prisoners there. They was riding, we was marching all the time. I remember that. And uh, we, our, our guy was a bosun mate, uh, first class bosun. He was a tough guy and he got up on them tables, all polished tables. So I'll fight any son of a bitch in this room. You don't believe it, step up here. Anybody in this room for this man's Navy. That's the kind of guy he was. He'd been in from the landing crash in Europe. And, and uh, he wanted the rooster. You get the rooster flag. There's a whole battalion there now. All these, all these houses, these bottom ones were 150 men, the top was 150 men, all the way down one side, all the way down the other side, and the drill hall on the top. And down below there was a... Uh, old dispensaries and stores and everything else. But we made it through that. We had to run, win the rooster flag, best march and best appearance. We won the rooster flag for that. And the day we graduated, I didn't get to graduate with my outfit. But I was in the uh, band in high school and they found that out and they needed a drummer for the drum, drum corps, the drum bugle. And that day it rained, so we marched inside the drill hall, and I was playing the bass drum. I normally play the snare drum, but I had to play the bass drum. So I was out for a couple of weeks practicing with them and doing things. So we, well, that's when I, we graduated. I got, of course, went with the company, but graduated in doing that. And uh, we had two work weeks instead of one. And we were one of the last outfits that went out before they turned it over, I think, to the Air Force. They took over Samson for a while. That was 45, and we got out of there, what, probably, the, the war, would the, the, dropped the bomb, and the war was over, and we was, went out in August or September or something, I don't know, something like that. What were the German prisoners doing? What was their jobs? Well, they was prison, they had a good life. They was being treated, they'd ride around the trucks, doing this, doing that, cleaning up, and, uh, I know I, I got one work week in the deep sinks and all that stuff, cleaning damn pie tins. I think they boil over every damn pie tin. And then, uh, of course, they're watching the line bringing in silverware. They're knocking the silverware. They can't do that. Get out and watch on submarine watch and all this shit. <laughs> and then they give us another week. So I said, I'm not volunteering for anything. But oh, that, that first week, I got even got into... Uh, I said, carpenter work, they can't mess you up. I knew what this running truck was, wheelbarrow, carpenter work. I said, we're going to go with carpenter work. Well, geez, they put us on that dispensary, and that, I don't know how many hundred feet that thing was. Go up on that, or we have what all we call three in one shingles, they're about that big. Had a, all the guys get up there, a lot of it, and lift every shingle up, put tar on it, and stomp it down. Well, you did that for about a week, you couldn't hardly stand up straight. That's what we had to do, so they wouldn't blow off. And then the last week, the last time, I said, I ain't volunteer for nothing. They had this thing, and they go, and they got the last damn job, garbage, garbage discovery dispensary. I said, I said, boy, I should have opened my mouth before this. My buddy that went with me, he, he, he wouldn't eat vegetables or anything. He don't eat meat, so he always got to cooking. He wanted to cook, so he got the chief's mess cook. So anyway, I said, man, I should open my mouth. A little Irish guy said, you got the best job. I said, it sure in hell sounded like it. 
He said, no, no, he said, you don't have to dress in a uniform or day, dress in your dungarees. He said, as long as you keep the place clean, that we had everything to clean. It had a great big block of refrigerator and had about 50 GI can to keep them clean. They had steam and everything and sweep the front. Hell, I had it made. I could sit out there. Had the guys would come out to get out and bring stuff to eat. So I had a good time and we got an A mark for the thing. We got out of that and they sent us out on a troop train and to the west coast and they said, well, I said, uh, he said, where do you want to? I said, I want a ship. What, what do I get to get the ship? Well, half of them want a battleships or aircraft carrier. I said, no, what's the best chance? They asked for destroyer. I said, okay, sign me up for destroyer duty. I tried to get my buddy to go along with me. He said, you talk me into enough stuff. <laughs> well, when, when we come back from Bootley, <laughs> Our one week boot we leave all we got. We went back and we went by train from Albany up to Sampson. I got up there and I said, geez, I don't we don't want to go back to that damn Sampson night. We don't have to be in there tomorrow morning. So we went to a movie and there was a guy named George White there in uh, Geneva. Had a place for service man to stay. So I said, We'll go over and see him, get a place to stay tonight. Well, it was all filled up. They said, well, go down to the police station, and they put the guys up. So I said, well, probably police barracks. Hell, that's anything is better than that. It was in the October, I think. Went down there, we went to the movie, come back, went down, went down instead of up in a big brick building. Went in the room, they had a couple cars. I thought, well, this is probably it, but they didn't stop there. They went to a cell block, over there, and went down two cells, took the padlock, said, you get in one, you won't get in the other. I said, well, he, he never said a thing. I said, well, he said, what time am I going to be woke up? I said, well, about 5.30. <laughs> Went in there, they just had a leatherette cushion thing, not what leather, and the uh, ship crap house in the one side, and the little sink, and that was it. And the red light was out right next to him. They put him, he didn't know what to do. He didn't go to bed all night. I went down in my skivvy shorts, and I went to sleep. I was tired out the hell, rolled my clothes up, and that was it. And they come in during the night, the MP is the shore patrol. What's these guys? Oh, they're just spending the night. <laughs> So he was, he was kind of into politics, so, and I said, wait till they get home and tell you you've been in the j brig all the time. <laughs> he said, you better not tell about this. <laughs> so that's why he said, you talked me in enough stuff. <laughs> so you, you went to the West Coast? Went to the West Coast out in a steam, a double unit, a steam train going out. And uh, went up through by, across by uh, Niagara Falls, open Canada, come back down the other side and out west through there, and out in uh, north and South Dakota, <coughs> South Dakota, there was one place, a big railroad town, and they stopped in and they were waiting for us. The Red Cross girls come out and they had pheasant sandwiches, and they, they were supposed to let us off the train. Well, they wouldn't let us out off a train. 500 guys on this goddamn thing. They wouldn't let us out. Well, they brought the, seven, the sandwiches on, the fed them to us, and I'd just been reading about this place in one of the old Life magazines. Well, the next stop you're going to get off, and that was uh, Mobage, South Dakota. Well, that was one street went from the railroad track up, and they didn't know what hit them. 500 guys got off on that train. They'd been on a couple of days, and they was hungry, and there's this and that. The bar rooms were filled. The guy at the grocery store holding the door got shut, and the guys would come with a basket of peaches or anything that go to go out with. <laughs> They wouldn't let anybody in, no. The guy said, the uh, engineer said, we're going to give you so long a time, we're going to give you one blast of whistle. you got five minutes, you don't get on the train, we're leaving. They left two men there. <laughs> they headed on out, went on out to, to uh, Portland, Oregon, to uh, Kaiser Fraser Shipbuilding, right, right there. That's where we ended up. And uh, by then it was, what was, that was the end of November, and the Thanksgiving and stuff. Anyway, we was there, that thing. I got, ended up with cat fever, so I was in uh, sick bay for about a week, and I bent my ankle over getting in the up. I've never used one of these up, up top bunks. <laughs> I come down and bent my ankle over, and I wanted to see Portland, Oregon, because we had a woman from our area I went to school with out there, and I was going to look her up, but I never got a chance. And uh, anyway, I, I got out of there well enough to serve, help serve about, I don't know how many thousand men come in. There was two lines coming on each side of this mess hall coming in. Uh, Army, Navy, everybody coming. The ships were just coming in the, there in Portland. My ship was all busted up, shot up, so they couldn't put me on it. What ship was that? I don't remember what name of that was, but it was a destroyer, but it was shot up. And they, so we served, and when them guys left, they had a, 
plate of food. They had two kinds of meat, cigarettes, anything they want when they left there for about five hours we served meals. And then we went up to a little, went to an Air Force base up above which the Air Force gave up and that was an old, like a wood, woodsman camp, had boilers out and old wooden bunks. We was there about a week and they got a bunch of us together and then went up to Puget Sound. Loaded up uh, APA uh, Leedstown for about three days and started across and the Pacific. It was 90 of us passengers. They put us up in the bow. The thing was empty. The other way I had a five inch mount up on the bow and one on the fan tail and the tubs. And uh, I did the seaman, the apprentice seaman, of course. And when the time I got outside of Puget Sound that night, got a little wrong and started getting a little bit of indigestion. I said, well, that ain't much, but the next day I knew I had stuff more indigestion. For about a week almost, I was seasick. I got seasick. And I couldn't even keep water down. He says, son, you gotta eat. I said, how am I gonna eat? I said, I, get, I can't keep water down, I'll throw it up. And I'm thirsty, I drink again, and up it comes. How am I gonna keep food down? Well, I said, I'll prove them wrong. I'll, I'll kill myself. I'll, I'll eat this stuff and show them I'll die with it, and that'll be the end of this. This is the easiest way out of this thing. So I ate, uh, what the hell was it? It was a uh, meatloaf. I went in that, and I ate that thing down, and the seas was rough. It got rougher. It went, but there was six tidal waves out there in that time, in 45. They went in the Aleutians. They went in Japan. They went in South America. I don't know where the rest went. Some days we gain mileage. Some days we lose mileage. We all slept with our life vests on, or belts, and uh, that, and uh, so anyway, that's before we got in the real tough part, but anyway, I ate that thing, first time I got, and they put the tables up chest high, when it's rough weather and that thing, and God, I went to empty my stuff up, I threw my dishes one way, and heaved up the GI time, went up, stayed, got in the chow line, come back down, ate the same thing over again. I swallowed, got to my dishes put away, and I started up the ladder, and that damn ship come up, and my belly come up, and I run like hell. The, the rail heaved over, and the wave come up, washed my face off, got in the line again, went through the same thing, ate it the same third time. I swallowed hard enough, I kept it down, I got over seasick. I said, by God, they're right. <laughs> then we had to stand up in a crow's nest, because I was seaman, up about 60 foot and above the superstructure, Go up there. A lot of them was afraid to go up there, climb over and watch that thing. Or out at night, in the middle of the night, on the flying bridge, out there and watch. So I'm what was the mic up in the crow's nest? Well, it was good, but I found out if I'd use them glasses to look, we're looking for actually derelict mines. We missed one mine by, oh, probably 50 or 100 feet, I'd say. They came past us. And I happened to see it at the beginning because a friend of mine went up there his first time up. And he said, oh, look at me, I'm up in the crow's nest. And I, I waiting for chow down noontime. I looked over and I see this goddamn thing throw by about that big around with these spikes out. I said, Jesus, I didn't know. That's got to be a goddamn mine. So I said, hey, you damn fool, report that mine going past. So then, he got, then they went around the thing too fast and the thing rocked like this and they shot at it with the twin four, uh, 20s. They didn't blow it up and they didn't sink it. And we left it like that. About a day later, I don't know, somebody got, one of them got blowed up with a mine back, and one of them ahead of us got blowed up with a derelict mine, and that's the way it was. We just wasn't lucky, we lucky enough to get by it. And we went in, so we supposed to have been over about 15 days. Well, it took us 23 days to get across. I'd have been there for the signing otherwise. And uh, that was, I know I was on the watch when we come into Japan. To, if we make it, we're going to go ahead. Nagoya, where the hell is Nagoya? Well, nobody didn't know what Nagoya was, didn't have no maps. We're going to Nagoya, Japan, if we make it. <laughs> and uh, we pulled in there that morning, I saw Mount Fuji in the distance, and the snow cap in the winter time, and it was cold, and the wind was blowing. I was up on the bow of that thing with all the wood, foul weather gear, and I had the exhaust fan. I only keep one with that. I said, I don't know what the hell I'm out here looking for. <laughs> Anyway, we pulled in, and they got us off, and they put us on, then got rid of them, of course, those rated guys all the way up to first class that signed over. They took them off the ships, and the whole, Nagoya Bay had uh, two of the biggest dry docks in the world. They take battleships, and American engineers help uh, build them, I guess, or, or put their brain behind it. And there was a hill there, right near us, 
I call it small railroad around with tunnels in and on top with guns with the Japs had. And in the back of there, we found out later on with the Japanese battleship, the, a Navy aviators or the Marine aviators sunk the damn thing, and they was raising that. We used to go past that to go to the railroad to go into uh, to uh, what the hell? The end of the capital there in, in uh, Japan, Tokyo. We used to go to Tokyo about probably about an hour on the ra electric railroad. We go in with these L LCI landing crafts, dressed up, and uh, go in the dock, try to smuggle cigarettes. We get three dollars for a pack of cigarettes and trade <laughs> and, and trade stuff. And uh, I go to Japan. I've been in MacArthur's headquarters, seen that, and right nearby with the Imperial Palace. They wouldn't let us in that. And they said, well, you, you'd have it carried home. I said, you're damn right, we'd have a piece of it if we got it. <laughs> so Ernie Pyle's theater, I didn't go in it. And uh, that was the first time in the MacArthur's headquarters I'd seen how things was. Uh, I had to go to the bathroom, and uh, there was mostly army around there. And I said, gee whiz, I see, the, I went to go in the bathroom. There's a woman in the bathroom. I'm like, oh, shit, I must have been in the wrong one. So I went out and went, turned around. Bye bye, I seen a couple army guys. I said, well, I can't hold it anymore. And I found out they didn't mind. They were sweeping around your feet, the women cleaning up while they were going to the urine or anything. They didn't think nothing of that. I said, well, this is a different life to me. You weren't quite used to that. Not really. <laughs> but uh, they put us on a tanker first. And that thing, uh, Navy tanker, and that thing they painted, I and another guy, they put us off the bow, said we'd get done when the paint is done. And the guy with me, he was afraid of height must be. And uh, he's cussing at the bosun mate. Well, that didn't go. He low, kept lowering us down. It was getting empty. Of course, a good ways off the bow when it's tanker when it gets empty. I said, Bill, you might better shut up. You're going to be in the water pretty soon. Pretty soon we stay in the water. Well, he's cussing ice. I said, well, the hell with this. And I said, here, you take it. And I jumped off, went around the bow of the ship and got to come up the ladder. I don't know how the hell he got up, but I, I said, I ain't going to sit here and stand this. They can go to heck with their pain. <laughs> but they got off on that, and we got on the one destroyer. Then the second destroyer, they, they took me, and that happened to be the Perkins. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing all the guns. And man, I, I love guns and all that. You ever shoot these things off? He says, son, when you get outside here, you see, you'll get tired of hearing them go off. <laughs> and, uh, what was your duty aboard the Perkins? Well, of course, you go on as a deckhand. And I was under, you swab decks, you painted, you chipped paint, and uh, you stood lookout watch on the way. We used to sail from Nagoya out and go down to Okinawa all week out. I was playing war, sailing with the aircraft carrier shangri -La, Sometimes the crews of Boston take looking for pilots going down or anything, or taking army doctors. And one time we, once we took the army doctors in, the mommy was Shima. That was down below Okinawa a little bit. That was the Jupa, J Japanese had their suicide boats in there. It was like going up the Hudson. It wasn't that wide. And all four destroyers went up there, and then there was a little island in the bay that was all, with land all the way around it, and a mountain there. And we took it over and we got our PTs went in there. And one of the skippers from the Roger, I think, got one of them uh, suicide boats, and of course no explosives, and they put an automobile seat where the explosive was, and it had to look like a six-cylinder Chevy Lay engine in it. And they'd steer it right on the gunnel, the rear of the thing, and go like mad. He could run circles around us there and play with that. Well, our skipper was a nervous rep. He, he didn't go for that <coughs> stuff, but he, Mr. Fleck, Thomas Fleck, and, we went in there one month, took him in there to inoculate against smallpox. And going up was all thatched huts, not regular buildings, thatched huts. And when we went back, we got a leave there. Uh, the, the starboard side got it first, and then the port side in the afternoon. I got in the afternoon one. I, I wanted to get a Japanese flag, and I had cigarettes. Well, everybody had been there off there. So I went up a mountain path to look at the woods and down the path. I didn't know where I was going. I said, well, I'll go and see how the forest is. I went down there probably a, a mile. There, there's a few of the big cove looking right out in the ocean. And there on one side was from the, the rich man's house of Evan Bay, it's stone and stuff. And down below all thatched huts and there was pyramid up, shaped up here and all the rice paddies and all the thatched huts. I went and one and looked around and see what I could see, and <laughs> they built the steps and they had just mats on the floor, a little charcoal burner to keep warm and cooking, all stuff was stuffing around, didn't have much, but that's 
where they lived. And down below, the beast of burden was a, a cow or a steer, and I suppose they used them for milk, and then they had them for a beast of burden. They had a place where they made a sack, sacky. Looked like it looked just like our where we made the sack or boiled maple syrup, something like that. And the old folks was out on the beach. They was up, and the kids and I give them my cigarettes and some away. Presetto, cigaretto, and then they'd want a cigarette, and they'd give me shells and that, and I was looking for it, and I, so I found, I saw one old Japanese, the toughest guy I ever seen, and he, both big as all, he wouldn't even talk to me, he just sat in this thing looking at me as though he wished I was dead. I gave him a cigarette and tried to talk to him, he didn't want to talk. He had both legs off at the knees, and uh, I met a couple guys from the other sister ships, and we went back to the ship, and I got a few souvenirs there, not much, and uh, we picked up the army doctors, I guess, that day, and went back, and then we kept that up. And one day we went, we, in Okinawa, we stopped, we get fuel sometimes, and mail. Only one can get there, there was, uh, the army was doing it, they had the six by sixes there, all them LSTs, and all them, the big, the, the bowels opened up, they had about five or six of them with the docks out, and they were bringing in material, it looked like ants coming and going. And uh, they had them colored boys there, drawing dirt in, they had no cabs on their trucks, and we, we went in to look for, we had musical instruments aboard ship, anything you'd want, con and all that, but all in the things had been busted up. And I was a drummer, I wanted to start a drummer, I, a band, I and another guy, he could play, uh, what to play clarinet, another guy played a guitar, so we're going to start a band, that's just an orchestra. That's what we had, that's what we had, did. So we had to get a clarinet reeds, we had to get strings for the, for the darn guitar, and I had to get a drum head for the snare drum. So we went in, an officer went with us, with a jeep. Well, since the ship had money, we couldn't buy them. If we didn't have no money, they'd give them to you. Give you any instrument you want, anything you want. A whole set of them we want. But we had instruments. We don't want a whole instrument. All we want was a drum head and that. Well, they had them. They couldn't sell them to us. They wasn't supposed to give them to us. They said, we're going to leave them here. Make sure they're going when we come back from dinner. So we had to steal them. And I remember sitting on the back of that truck and we get between these two big six by sixes with the dirt and they smile and see how close they come to us. I said, man, them damn brakes don't work. This Jeep ain't going to be worth a damn. I'm ready to bail out. Officer was driving, but I got to see Okinawa. That was on one day. Then they got bringing Japanese or American carbines back. They were dumping their rifles over suicide cliff by the truckload. And every day they come back and the officers got them carbines. I loved that man. I'd be up on the bridge on the way at that time, I'd be out, but since I was in the, still in the deck crew, and they were shooting at the powder cans, three five-inch powder cans put together with a flag on it. They tried to sink, and they talked to the next guy. Well, we didn't get it, and they, they shoot at it with a 38. So. Anyway, we had fun. One day, the uh, outcome, we was up on the on superstructure there, working on the guns. The Bill Ferdin, he had one, I had another. And we, of course, we had guys helping us. And uh, this helicopter come on. Look at this. this of course, beginning the helicopters. It was a B-29 base. All them goddamn flying cigars. It would look like. Anyway, they come out with this helicopter with the bubble nose and uh, bosun chair hanging down below. And they brought a guy out in a motor whale boat. And they brought mail over, delivered mail and all that. And they took this guy up on our bow. He got in a bosun chair and went up and waved everybody away and went back. And it was about four or five miles, I say, into where the shore was. We didn't go back to Look at them lucky guys, the Air Force. That's the thing we ought to have been in. Look at that, they're having a good time. Well, they got in near shore. And all at once that damn thing dropped. I said, Bill, you see that? He said, yeah. I said, I don't, I think, I don't know whether that was near shore or right near the cliffs. I said, it was awful close. It never come back up. I said, let's go down and see the officers of the day and see if they know whether that thing got back. So we went and asked them. They called and no, it never got back. And we told them why. I, we think it might have went down and never come back up. It went down in such a funny way. Uh, of course, we couldn't see the guy hanging below it. They never took the guy up. He hung about 50 feet below this damn thing. The way he went all the way in. What happened, they went in, Bill went in with them, I didn't get to go in, they found the thing. Sure enough, the guy in the bosun chair fell out near shore. How he fell out, rode all that way and then fall out, I don't know. It was warm, wasn't cold. 
Fell out. The guy in the helicopter went down to help him. Lost control and they lost both guys. Helicopter off, just as like that. Two guys off the phone. I said, well, I guess that was a bad thing to be. <laughs> well, that's such things like that happen. You never know when it was going to happen. Other days we'd be the aircraft carrier Shangri-La. We used to go, two of us go alongside, and if still our main mast wouldn't hardly get to the superstructure or the main deck. They looking down at us, taking on fuel, taking a man across, a breeches boy, and all that stuff, playing around with that. And uh, such things like that. You never know what was going to happen. And, and uh, it was it was a young man's outfit. Things were going on. You read about it the day he was there tomorrow. And they got to where they wanted me to, well, I went in the gunnery division. I said, I want to get in the gunnery division. Well, I got a, a seaman first class, the old guy up on the bow of that ship, he's Chief Halster. He gave me the first class uh, test. And I loved knots as a kid. That was my hobby. I wasn't into Boy Scouts that much, but I could tie any kind of knot, do rope splicing or anything else, eye splicing. So that was good. I got through that easy, and I got the gunnery division, and uh, that was a lot better than deck. They gave me that quad 40, and then we used to carry ammunition too. I carried ammunition. I and another guy. It was a big swell that day. It wasn't a big rough sea, but it would come in right up over the life. Well, the line's about that high. A cable alongside this, the deck. We hang on right up to the waist, carrying quad 40. And, and the canisters fill up our thing, and then we shoot it up the next day. That one day we shot so many shells, I don't know how many. I know uh, they have a net to catch them so they won't go up and deck. They're about that long, empty shell. And they come down, and there's four guns going off, all in it. And uh, we filled that up and went out on the deck and run over to the side. So I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of rounds we fired shooting landing crab. And, Play, uh, sleeves and all this stuff. And the five inch, I used to be in, the, when I'm in the deck crew, I was in the, under the five inch of number one in the merry ground. It's like a silo. They put you in it, and the walls that goes around back and forth. There's uh, projectiles on top and powder on the bottom, and they're loaded up on the outside. In the middle of the elevator going up in the gun mount, they're moving. You can't get claustrophobia, you can't get dropsy. If you drop anything, you got to carry out. You're locked in there. If anything happens, you're locked. There ain't no getting out the damn thing. You can't. You can't think about. I didn't even worry about. I was having a good time. I was doing a thing. I passed up the powder first, so you see how you handle that. Then the projectiles, they were dangerous. They had fuses. You had to put them in a certain way. You had to keep them in the ass for certain fuses. In other words, they want high explosive, or they want uh, a star shell, a Buck Rogers shell, or or uh, armor piercing, or this, you had to know the, what color they was and send them up. You had two guns, and they were going up about every time they made you up. Anytime you had an empty one, you'd fill it up. And uh, up in the gun mount. Well, then I got in the gun crew, then I got a gun of my own, a quad, and I liked that. And one day, the, as I say, we shot at the damn hole. They're water cooled, and the hose broke, flew through my face. So we had to put that stuff in that, the tanks in there when they got it back. One day we had to jam, had to get the jam out, keep the thing going, learn how to unjam the thing. They had to, each gun had a guy up on a carriage riding with it. I was the pointer and the trainer was on the other side. I shot it with a foot pedal, turned the electric on and I could control it. It was with a mount director. They did all with radar or all that. All the guns had radar on. We were lucky had that stuff. And uh, you could run it, or I could run it with a joystick up and down, do it all. You or last, you could crank it by hand. And then the other day, they had us back in the fan tail. Who also when I was in the gunnery, I instead of going on the outside on radio, I'd be inside on the wheel. Damn hell, and watch. The gyro and all that. And uh, I was on the office of the deck one day. I know I was out there, and a couple of things happened out there. One day he come on. Oh, he was going off. He's going to. He had. He carried the 45, and he was going to. He unloaded it, and he ready to drive fire. And I said, Sir, don't 
don't pull that trigger. He says, why? I said, because you got it loaded. He says, yeah, I just emptied it. I said, you emptied it the wrong way. And I never had, the only thing I saw in the Navy when I went in was a twenty two rifle. I never messed with a Springfield, which I knew about as a kid, or a forty five. Or I shot the twenty two. I and another guy got the high score because I always was in the gun club from when a kid. And uh, I said, don't fight. I said, I unloaded it. I said, you unloaded it wrong. He, un he unloaded the top first and then took the clip out and going to fire. I said, that's the wrong way. You got to take the clip out first and then take the empty. And he worked, I said, work the action one more time, please. And out, he was surprised. He was going to shoot right through the ship's office with it. But that's the way. Another time, the, the halyard line went up for anybody coming aboard. The flag went up with this. And that broke. They wanted somebody to go up and fix that. I said, well, I'll go up and fix this thing. You want to go up and fix it? I said, why not? No big deal. I went up and said, wait a minute, it's electric. I turn off some of that. We had all, it was a tripod with extra radar and all kinds of stuff on it. They got it off and I went out the yard on. They had regular things to hang on, put on, just like they do on the sailing ships you walk on, hang on. I put the halyard up and put it in there. And another time, uh, I, I don't know, I guess I was in the gunnery division. They wanted to go rescue the motor whale boat in Okinawa. Well, the guys come back and they get a little bit drunk. I'm sure. <laughs> I didn't secure it. Well, up come a storm, and the next morning we didn't have, didn't have no more to whale boat. Let's change tapes. Okay. Well, anyway, motor whale boat was gone, so they asked for volunteers. So I said, oh, I'm ready to go, anything, I don't care. So they gave us brand new army boots, infantry boots and an army sweater, brown sweater. Water actually warm down there and that. Well, that's what they gave us, so we put them on. I didn't even, I didn't even wear a life preserver. There were belts that went around to unsnap and you had CO2 in me or blow them up by hand. That's the only life preserver they had. Well, I didn't have mine that day. I said, well, we're going in, what the hell, I, no big deal. They got in there, we found the motor whale boat after two days. It was sunk, just the top was sitting out the canvas had holes bashed in, it was way in up to the coral, right by a big old house barge. They had the storms there just before we got there, sunk a lot of destroyers and everything in 45, they had bad storms. They lost a lot of ships in there, plus the kamikazes and everything else were coming in. It was a, once we dropped anchor, we they had to send a, a diver over to the officer, only one could dive, he put a hard hat on, had to go down and cut the damn anchor free. The cable is shit. You drop the anchor, you might not get it. And I said, well, anyway, they say, wait, a motor whale boat. I said, what's the big deal? Go get another whale boat. Son, you don't get one of them. They only put one to a man. I said, well, don't they have any? No, they made up in New England State to get one, one motor whale boat. If you lose that, you don't have no more. There is no more. And uh, anyway, we got it out after two days and uh, uh, got it back to the ship and they put it up in the went the way they had three, four hold books. Plank about that thick, busted right through from there. We go way up in the air. I expect that day some of them guys were going to get their legs busted because it would go up and hang on, and your feet were going under when it come down and smell it. Boom. It weighed tons. Had a four cylinder motor in it, gasoline motor. Took a coxswain, a uh, 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 coxswain, a motorman, and a coxswain, and I would use some type bow hook up on the bow. The damn thing. But over there, but when we come back to stage, where you have a bow hook on it. Anyway, we got the thing, they say that, and then they sent us in another day to get a landing craft, like we went up, up through the canal with, and two of us went on, and uh, the coxswain that driving it, he was in charge, and they didn't seem to train the guy, didn't know how to do things, so they, they had this one landing craft lashed fast to this houseboat, and they wanted to get that. So we went alongside the stupid thing and lashed the thing fast and they told me, okay, cut her loose. So I had to act, we cut the lines loose and we let them loose with it. He, with it. he got two big engines in that thing with all the power they had. We going, and it was going backwards. It wasn't gaining the damn surf going in. It was too much high. Pretty soon we hit one rudder. He said, cut that thing loose. We're going to lose them both. Well, they should have stood off and let me go on and put a line on it, we'd have got the thing, but that's what he wanted to do. So we cut like hell, cut cables, everything else. Got, we just barely saved the one, and then we made it because we lost one and, and, and hit one rudder. And I said, well, they didn't know what the hell they were doing. I said, anybody ought to know better than that, but he was boss. That's the way they did it. 
But that's the way it went. So anyway, we had a good time of something going on, and they wanted me to sign over. They're going to give me third class gunner's mate if I sign over. Then they give me a year or month's leave. I said, no, I want to go home first. And we were coming home uh, on the way home, and uh, we saw these uh, French ships being towed in there for the Anna Weetok bomb blast. They were, they were going to blast that. We didn't see Anna Weetok, but and the Japanese battleships and ships being towed in there to go on that. And uh, they wanted me to go see that. I said, no, I'm not going to volunteer for it. I'll go with the ship. We'll go sign up for that, but I'm not going to sign up otherwise. And I said, I hear the ship is going to the East Coast. I'd like to sign up for that. No, you got to sign up or we got to discharge you. I said, well, I want to go home first. When I come back, I probably didn't no. I said, okay, give me my papers. That was it. And I had, oh, probably at that time, I had about 13 months I was in the service. So I went up to L.A. They got 500 guys on that, and the steam engine went back across. They come out in Pullman cars. And we ate in the dining car. On the way back, we got what we, I heard what they call the cattle cars and the troop Pullman. Well, they would wooden cars with wooden bunks in or the coal stove. We ate out the railway baggage car out of milk cans. We got out in the middle of the desert down there. We headed up towards Chicago. We're waiting there. We figured a train coming this way. Hell, there's a slow freight coming the same way we'd go. We had to get off the track and let them pass. They didn't care when the hell we got home. We got up in Chicago. 500 guys got off on this. Of course, right between two civilian trains. Well, that was a bad thing to do. Of course, these guys are looking under, they see nice women's legs going, so they got to skip a few rocks across. One of them hit, one of them in the damn leg with a rock, overcome an Air Force officer. He's going to have the whole goddamn train quarantined or something. <laughs> so the guy, a chief, he said, get this damn train on, we get on, get out of here before we all get in the break. <laughs> and we ended up in Lido Beach, Long Island. For discharge. But that's the way they go. You get a bunch of guys, you know, you don't know what they're going to do. Now, you have a picture of your, uh, your ship. Yeah. Uh, could you show us uh, where your gun mount was? Well, right here, that, that's the only gun mount you can see. Right here is the gun mount. Okay. Now, you mentioned it was dented. Yeah, it's dented. You probably won't see it with this thing. Okay. okay. It's dented. It got bashed in coming over with a, they said a 52 degree roll in the, uh, the quartermaster was on uh, on watch. He went on. He thought he he just came off and watch. He's one of the few guys that still see at the reunion. I remember. And uh, he said, "I thought we was going." He said, "That thing went over. They laid out." I said, "Well, here we go." Before they lost a lot of them in storms before that, and the thing laid there and by and by it come up gradually. We I was asleep, thank God, in the fan tail where the gunnery deleted was. The Marines we bring them back. They said, can we get a ride back? Now nah, we don't have no place for you, you guy, you know. Said, what do you need? <laughs> well, we had the Commodore aboard, acting Commodore for the squadron destroyer. He thought he, if you can find a Jeep, he'd like to have a Jeep. So they went away for a couple hours, they come back. Said, well, we got one. He says, down to the extra dock, the next dock if you want. Can, you get, can we come aboard now? Yeah, we got a place for you. <laughs> They put some up in the bow and some in our quarter, about four of them in our quarter, Marine guys. And we give some a quad 40 on near the fan tail to play with and keep them out of here. But them poor guys in our part, department there, they didn't know where the head was, you know what the head is. Or the, they didn't, and they heaved up there and the crap there, they make them clean it up. I don't believe they ate. And the time we went, we, as I say, we went out, we hit some real, it was 45 degrees all night. You imagine this room walking half of 90 degrees and you walk against the side wall, then going up and down like this, boom. All night long, well, they were sick and that. When they got to Hawaii, we got out and said, we ain't going any farther. Is this the way we gotta go home? We're gonna fly home or we're gonna stay here? The hell with this thing, because some of them, the rest of them, some of them came home with, but most of them got right out. They didn't want no more of that damn destroyer. <laughs> But uh, that's the way things would go. Yeah. So was, uh, what, how would you summarize your experiences? Well, it's always something, you know. We got back there in the States of coming to San Diego. Of course, I'd never been down there. 
And I got bow hook job every once in a while. We go in this store. Of course, I, we all had coffee pots. We made good coffee. We had them mugs with no handles on. We always had them vacuum vacuum pots in those days. They make coffee, good coffee, all the time. And we go in, send the boat in or the, the thing in, get some doughnuts. And sometimes they had a water taxi. You go in to Liberty. One street up was all there was in San Diego. Coming from the harbor up was all, all I remember. And uh, I get bow hook, and I have to be dressed up with a, uh, this uniform day, my dress blues, out there with your damn shoes on. It's trying to stay on the bow, ain't nothing to hang on. And this thing was waving, you throw the hook on to hold it while the officers got in, or whoever, captain, or anybody, that's the way to go to shore. More than once I thought I'd go off. I didn't have no life reserve, I could swim. And the other one of the late things they did coming in, they, we had a hook on to a boy. We didn't go into harbor, we went into a dock. So it was, <coughs> there was going to be four of us to this boy. But one or two of them was already hooked on. <coughs> a great big ring about that, big, big heavy ring. And this boy is waving in the water like this. Now, I don't know, I think I, think I had my dungarees on that day. I don't know, I forget. But it sent I and another guy on to put that thing in. And the anchor chain is quite big for one of these things. I said, man, a great place to I realized it. This is a great place to lose your hand because this thing is rocking. This thing was down and it was up and it was down and it was rocking this way. And you got this chain, you're trying, and we got a shackle. You know what a shackle is? Well, a great big shackle, you put a thing through. Well, I had to get it through that ring and had to put it through the chain and not drop everything. Well, we got it done. And uh, nobody got hurt and that, so. That's the way it went. We just lucky, didn't get hurt, didn't lose a hand. But I figured, man, it's a great place to lose a finger. So fast you'd be smashed, you wouldn't even know what happened. But that's the way they send guys out. They didn't know whether we could do it or not. Chain it up. So you got discharged and it was a long island? Yeah. Yeah, we went across and down there and uh, I got discharged and uh, got three campaign ridden, Asiatic Pacific, the victory, and I guess the... Uh, American Theater or something like that, three ribbons. Uh, when, when it wasn't in any battles, uh, it, that our destroyer was made down in Orange, Texas. There's a bunch of them made there, up in Orange, uh, a River up there. I didn't even know they had rivers there, but they had one up there. They made them there. They made them in Staten Island. They made them up in, uh, up in Norfolk and up in Maine. And these are Garing class destroyers. There was, uh, I think, it was. 390 feet long. Uh, anyway, and they hold enough fuel to go across the Pacific. That was the reason. They, they wasn't as quite as fast as the old Fletchers. They was narrower and wasn't as long, about 40 feet less. But they would go across the Pacific, and they were made for the invasion of Japan, which we were for. Uh, and I said, well, when, how long can you keep us in? He said, well, you might be one year, five years, or whatever, plus six months after that. So they didn't know how long to have it. So they didn't, they got us in there, and they didn't want, didn't want to do, they didn't want to give us a thing, and else we signed over. So they shipped us out. <clears throat> and luckily, I didn't take a, take a commission, or a get third class, because I, I got home, and things wasn't going good. It wasn't that much to do. <clears throat> Hell, I had to go back to high school. I realized I needed that. Uh, so I said, gee, I'd have went back. Sure in hell and signed over. This is sure the devil. But I went to high school, finished that up, and got through that. And I took my GI and went to, to, down to Tacoma Park, Maryland, right outside of Washington. It was a Navy school once. And uh, it was back to Bliss Electrical School. And I took up electrical. There, but I want a hands-on electric motor, and this is more electronics, I, IBM stuff, or uh, that's what they taught. And I, I didn't, I, it was okay, I learned to run the slide rule, I had the mass I could use and all that, but I didn't appreciate the damn stuff. I wanted the motors, the motor control. And uh, I didn't finish it all the way up. I was supposed to be graduating. Three of us walked away one day. I said, what the hell with this? Two guys from Pennsylvania and I in, in January. I come home, I got married, and I went back and I said, to hell with this thing, I ain't getting what I want out of this thing. I said, it's a great school and all that, but I don't want to come down here in Washington to work. I want to be home where the construction is. So I come home and I got a job. And 
Oh, I got to do different things for a while, and then I even worked in Logwood for one summer. I wasn't home very long, got a job there, 85 cents an hour all day, all by myself with a clean track taking out log way back on Red Hill. The guy would come in twice a day, see if I was still alive, and help me put the track back on. That's the way I was 18 years old, <laughs> or heading into 19, and my, my, uh, uh, my brother-in-law and them was cutting the logs because I didn't see nobody, and I survived that okay, didn't get hurt or anything. I was always around machinery, had to be careful. Uh, I realized this, and anyway, uh, that's the way that went. And then I got a chance, my dad, he knew the right ones, and, and uh, making the damn Healy, and you want to go on the tunnel? No, everybody's getting killed in the tunnel. Oh, the heck with that. So he said, you ever drive a truck? I said, yeah, I drove a truck, a regular truck. But this was Ukes with the trailers from behind. They, I don't know, the big one weighed over 100 tons loaded. They were 30 cubic yards, and ours were 20, 25. But anyway, I drove dirt, and it was a lot of fun, and, and they sent me where I could get a book Take fifty dollars, go down to Newburgh, and I'll get a ball. So I got it first, and away I went. So I worked all summer on that, ten hours a day, six days a week. I cleared a hundred dollars, a dollar and a half an hour back when telephone companies make about thirty-two dollars a week, and so was the guy in the, in the electric crews wasn't making one. Well, it was like gold. And then I went out of there and. Uh, we did old 17 over for the for Cooney Brothers in Ferndale, New York. They put a batch plant in there at an old uh, railroad yard and redid old 17 before they built the new one and put that up. And then they worked in uh, after that. They said, well, there's no more. Said, well, you go into, you go over to the tunnel, report in there, go to work. That was 1950. I went to work there and I, uh, three dollars an hour outside, three and a quarter in the tunnel. And I, after a while, I was getting three and a quarter all the time with troubleshooter. I was in and out and all over the job. Telephones in, had to keep 2300 apart in the tunnel, three phase, 2300, one coming from Central Hudson, one coming from Nysick on the other end, working 480 volts in there and stuff, and 120, 110, 220 going down light lines, compressed layer, and it was a good job, dangerous job, but you didn't worry about getting killed because uh, you did, you wouldn't go in. Two times I could have got, I just missed getting uh, cave-ins. Last one blew my hat off, it was so close, the whole portal caved in, they were putting ice and snow off. I was fixing the telephone line, they come out and the whole portal come down, big two-inch plank and everything off, right, blew my hard hat off, I couldn't believe it looking back at me. Now where was this tunnel? This is in, go from Never Sink, New York to Gramesville. The water goes through New York City, goes from the Never Sink Reservoir to uh, um, um, Roundout Reservoir, Merriman Dam. How long did it take to complete that? Well, we went in there, I don't know, they've been doing it probably a year or two, and I was on it five years. They completed the tunnel and cemented it. They bid that job for a million dollars a mile and a man a mile. They got six million dollars to do that job. They didn't know, and they did the test borings to see what they were going to go because they didn't know what they were going to run in, might have to pull. But under Wine Coop Shaft was two and a half miles in, about a Wine Coop Shaft, and they were running poor stuff, they had to put steel under there. And uh, two times electric, I should have been electrocuted, but I never got hurt. None of these times, so close. Once with 2300, once with 480, but I didn't get no shock. Should have blew up with us. Uh, that, that one I'll tell you about that, we went in on Saturday, and we were getting double time, six dollars and a half an hour, and the boss said, yeah, come on, this big parkway cable has been through here, been going through what we call the arch forms, the last thing they're doing. And get the hell out of here, we're getting double time, we get out of here, we get Saturday all day, you know. And he, I said, we got to use a hot blood, we're undoing the box here, a steel box which they were spliced together in. It was supposed to have been dead for a month. Take these apart, and we're going to put in a can with disconnects in. And he don't need gloves on. This guy, Arnold Stratton, he's dead now. He was my partner. He'd look at me, and I'd argue with the boss and argue with him. Put your gloves on. Do that. Well, I was carving in my buck. If he'd have did it right off the bat, it would have been bad. But he waited. I got through my buck. He put his gloves on and started carving. A buck is what you cut big copper wire for, about as big as my thumbs. 
and uh, I carved through mine, I put it off on the thing, and we have what we call ungrounded delta, where you can ground out one side out, even 2300, and it won't nothing happen, you draw an art. I said, see you damn fool, ain't you glad you put your gloves on? Well, he'd put his gloves on, got carbon in his, but he hadn't got it ground out. So I ground again, I got another arc, I said, by geez, this ain't no capacitance. They, they think it was like capacitance in a cable, like they do uh, capacitor, store up cable. It will store it up sometime. So I went down the tunnel, the boss went up, sure it was, right across the line. Been hot all the, for a month going through, and nobody got hurt from it. That's the way it went. If we put them together, it just blew up in their face. Wasn't our day to go, so we come up, they never got hurt, but very, very close. So you uh, had a pretty busy life. I'm still busy. Still do a little electric work and uh, get some of the miserable jobs somebody don't want to do. Help anybody if I can. Tell a lot of people on the phone how to fix things if they can. They want to know. That's like God saved me. Six times in life I should have been killed. Once, nine years old, I got run over with a car. Completely old, got up and run away from it. Got a bang elbow and a cut head. That's the bus driver run over me. Bus driver owned the bus, and I was getting out of the school bus. He didn't have to stop in those guys days, and went to get the post, go in the post office, get my mail, and got run over. And he didn't even know he hit a guy. He only had one eye, and I was dressed in brown. The car was brown. He went down a little way, got out, looking under the car, and went on to Lacquer, where the, where the dam was made, about eight, ten miles below where we live. And then I got another time uh, I got shot at in the woods hunting. I heard the bullet hit beside me and the gun go off. That's pretty damn close. So six times I could have got killed. I never got hurt. Just You're a lucky man. I said the good Lord wanted me around here for something, so I better help people. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mr. Fuller. Yeah.